So it's official. Attack on Titan is over. One of the most popular anime to ever be made, 10 years in the running, has finally closed the book. A sprawling epic story that begins as a character study of children trying to survive in a world that doesn't seem to want them alive eventually evolves into a political thriller about the greater evils of a bigger world. Problems like pure titans in the wall soon become trivial at the grand scope of a geopolitical scheme that forced the Eldians to live on an island secluded and locked away from the rest of the world. Eren, our once beloved main character slowly but surely descends into madness and becomes the antagonist of the story. While characters like our once timid Armin take a step into the grand stage to become are true heroes. See, Attack on Titan, whether you like it or not, is one of the most polarizing anime and manga ever made, with the entire fan base roughly split 50-50 as to whether or not Eren is justified in his actions. And whether or not you agree with Eren, and more notably the rumbling, it's hard to pick out another character in anime who's as divisive and as talked about as Eren Yeager. Yes, that story, one of the most impressive stories ever written, has come to a close. And you probably hated the ending. At least numbers say you probably hated the ending. Because most people hate the ending. See, manga readers had to deal with hating the ending of Attack on Titan what feels like years ago. And the backlash of Attack on Titan's ending was so severe that the mangaka himself had to release multiple apologies. Now, will I I am not a fan of the ending of Attack on Titan. I'm also super not about yelling at creatives for the things that they create, unless those created things make actual real life harm. So the manga community's reaction to the ending of Attack on Titan really wasn't my favorite thing of all time. And I'm assuming the anime only reaction is probably gonna be worse. See, because here's the thing. Us as manga readers of Attack on Titan had been holding on to the hope that there was a possibility that the anime universe and the manga universe were actually separate, though canon to each other. And that in actuality, the ending of the manga universe was the beginning of the anime universe, giving us as manga readers the hope that the anime might have a different ending. And while admittedly, I am filming this video before the last episode of Attack on Titan comes out, the reason I'm doing that is because I know it's gonna end the way that the manga ended, which is why I said, there's a good chance that you're probably upset right now. And I'm gonna say it somewhat justifiably. The ending of Attack on Titan is just not good. There's moments where the ending of Attack on Titan truly shines, but by and large, it's kind of a nightmare. There's death baiting, everything happens a little bit too conveniently, and the themes of the end truly waffle. So the real question is, where did the Attack on Titan ending go wrong? And if I, or we as a community, were to rewrite the ending of Attack on Titan, how would we change it? Well, unfortunately, I can't read your mind. And listen, there is a fair to good chance that you actually enjoyed the ending of the manga or the ending of the anime. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. If you liked the ending, that's great. I just didn't. And I'd like to tell you why I didn't like the ending. The problems that I identified in the ending that I feel as though mired the ending to an incredible story. But once again, I'm not saying it's wrong for you to enjoy the ending of Attack on Titan. If you do, that's awesome. Because genuinely, I wish I was in your shoes. I did enjoy Attack on Titan much in the same way that I enjoyed Game of Thrones. I would have liked both of those stories to get better, more cohesive endings. Now that we got that disclaimer out of the way, let's get into today's video. Because today we're talking everything wrong with Attack on Titan's ending. But before you get to sending me death threats, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And if you guys really want to hear my breakdown of this last episode of Attack on Titan, guys, go ahead and listen to my anime podcast, Talk is Anonymous, where me and Danny to break down everything that happened in anime this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Or if you just want to look like somebody who has opinions about the ending of Attack on Titan, guys, go ahead and meander into my anime merch store, where you can pick up some of the greatest anime t-shirts, sweatshirts, and sticker packs known to man. So, Attack on Titan, an incredible, long-running story, now over. Now, the problem with incredibly long-running and popular stories is that 
they're pretty hard to end. Well, at least in a way that people appreciate. You have to give all the fan favorite characters their appropriate endings, maybe sprinkle a little bit of romance in there and assure everybody that the universe is gonna be safe now that all the problems are fixed. And that's really tough to do, especially when you built out a story where the main character is an 80 meter tall walking skeleton killing 80% of humanity's population. Really hard to walk the line of finding romance for them and making sure all the world's problems are fixed, which is probably why we got the ending from Attack on Titan that we did and why many people are upset with it. So what are the problems as I've identified them with Attack on Titan's ending? Well, so far as I see it, there's three major problems. And the first and probably least offensive problem with Attack on Titan's ending is the never-ending stream of convenience. Well, at least the never-ending stream of convenience for the anti-Aaron side. So Connie, Jean, Levi, Mikasa, Armin, Reiner, the anti-Jaegerists. See, nobody is under any illusion that this team was anything but the underdogs. Anime only people, even if you haven't seen the last episode of the anime yet, and if you haven't, go watch it, will know that one of the most important fighters in the anti aaron side, Annie, has decided to not go to the battle, which means that this underdog squad has lost one of its most important fighters. Not good. For the majority of the first episode, it appears as though this loss of Annie is gonna result in some more losses, if you know what I mean, with almost every single member of the anti aaron squad sustaining some kind of injury or just straight up being kidnapped. However, don't worry, these underdogs seem to have an insane amount of luck, because the first real moment where this never-ending stream of luck tends to start is Falco's transformation. See, Falco has become the Jaw Titan. And when Falco becomes the Jaw Titan, it destroys the ship that Annie and everybody else who didn't go to fight Aaron was on, thus sinking it. However, fortunately for Falco, and I guess everybody else, Falco's Jaw Titan transformation just happens to be a bird. The first Titan in observable history who's ever had the ability to fly. Not even just fly a little bit, like soar. And that comes into play. One, because it allows Falco to get to the battlefields where everybody is fighting Aaron very quickly. And two, because Falco has the ability to fly and he decides, well, there's really no excuse for me not to head to the battlefields now. Except for the fact that everybody who went to go fight Aaron left on a plane. If there was no excuse for you not to go with Falco, how was there an excuse for you not to go with Armin and everybody else? The mode of transportation is exactly the same. But before any of this happens, and what results in Annie and Falco being the heroes of the situation, is the fact that Armin is gobbled up by Ymir. Well, sort of Ymir. It's a pig titan that's loosely implied to be controlled by Ymir. Now, Ymir is focusing on attacking Armin because Ymir understands that Armin is going to transform into a Colossus titan to destroy Eren. And thus, Armin's kind of public enemy number one to Ymir, who also wants the destruction of all humanity. At least is what we're told. However, Ymir slash the pig titan don't injure Armin at all, so he doesn't transform into the colossal titan. I mean, sure, Ymir as the pig titan could have just, oh, I don't know, bitten off Armin's head, but instead, Ymir as the pig titan focused more on just capturing Armin in a way that didn't harm him so he wouldn't turn. And because Armin is pulled into the mouth of this pig titan, he's apparently sent to the coordinate. They never really explain why, but let's just say he gets knocked out in the process and for some reason he wakes up in the coordinate, where he has a conversation with Zeke about the real reason that humanity should continue to exist. And that is for little moments, like playing catch or chasing your friends through a field. And apparently this is all Zeke needed to hear because Zeke stands up and goes, you're right, there is reasons to survive and we should fight for that. So him and Armin decide to work together to awaken everybody who was asleep in the coordinate. And then through the powers of the founding Titan, they all get to manifest in their Titan shifter forms from Aaron's rib cage. Kind of like how he manifested the beast Titan to destroy all those airships. So all of them just manifest because they've been asleep in the coordinate, but not all Titan shifters manifest, just the ones that we know. But this is kind of confusing and like kind of shakily explained because here's the thing. The only way this could have happened is through the power of the founding Titan. And considering the fact that Ymir went with Eren and she herself is the physical representation of the founding Titan's power, this would imply that for some reason, Ymir decided to use her powers to allow these people to reawaken in the coordinate and then have them manifest on Eren's chest. But everything we knew about Ymir and everything that Eren tells us about Ymir 
after everything happens implies that Ymir wanted somebody to understand her and to break her out of her love for Carl Fritz. However, by being broken out of her love for Carl Fritz, that translated into her destroying humanity, the people who had abused her power for 2,000 years. So why is Ymir allowing people to reawaken in the coordinate and then manifest on Aaron's chest? Now, technically, you could say it was Zeke who did it because Zeke has royal blood and he was in the coordinate, but Zeke would have to coordinate with Ymir and Ymir only listens to people with royal blood. And that doesn't even matter anymore because Aaron broke her out of that cycle. So how did they manifest? I don't, like, I, there's somewhat answers, but not really. But now that all of these Awoken Titan Shifters have appeared, they're able to fight off the non-Awoken Titan Shifters that have been being created by Aaron's ribcage, which gives the anti-Aaron team enough time to save Armin from the old pig mouth. Listen, I'm also aware that Armin says that Ymir wants connection, and that's why all Eldians are connected through the coordinate, and Ymir is technically present at the moment of the reawakening, but Ymir is flip-flopping. That's what I'm saying. And it's weird that Ymir is flip-flopping and that we never really get an explanation as to why. However, when all of these Titan Shifters reawaken, Zeke pops out of Aaron's ribcage and kind of waves to Levi. Levi does not take that well and immediately decapitates Zeke, which stops the rumbling. See, the common explanation here is that Zeke was Eren's way to control the Founding Titan's power. And now that Eren no longer had Zeke's royal blood, he can control the Founding Titan as well, which temporarily halts the rumbling, which would imply that Zeke has to remain in the coordinate for Eren to control the Founding Titan's abilities. Or in a more direct sense, that is to say that Eren has to be in contact with somebody of royal blood in order to use the Founding Titan's abilities. However, this kind of contradicts a couple of key plot points throughout AOT. See, in Chapter 50, in 51 of Attack on Titan, I don't know the episodes, when Eren punches the Smiling Titan, it's revealed that that Smiling Titan was Dina, who has royal blood, which then allows Eren to be able to use the Founding Titan's abilities to kill Dina and then send all the pure Titans after Reiner. That contact he makes with Dina lasts like a second, and Dina dies. He directs all the pure Titans to attack the Smiling Titan first and then attack Reiner, which means in that moment, Eren isn't connected to royal blood. What's weirder than all of this is the fact that it was heavily implied that the reason that you needed royal blood to be able to control Ymir is because of her loyalty to Karl Fritz, the original royal. However, now that Eren has broken her out of that system, it's largely implied that royal blood is no longer needed, as Ymir is now free to do whatever she wants and is no longer bound to doing exactly what those with royal blood want her to do but whatever let's just say it's a biological response and that the only way that you can control the founding titan's powers is if you're in contact with or have somebody with royal blood cool whatever zeke's death stops the rumbling it's a little shaky but by far and away not the worst thing that happens here but this does bring up my second point with attack on titan's ending the fact that it's kind of confusing and not like oh i'm reading it and i have no idea what's going on but oh, I'm reading it, and this goes against most of the things that I know. See, the entire ending of Attack on Titan revolves around the Founding Titan. However, the real question is, what is the Founding Titan? Is the Founding Titan Ymir or the centipede that attached to her spine? The answer is apparently both, but also neither. See, because while we do talk about what the centipede thing is, and it's based off some ancient biological life form whose name I've completely forgotten, basically all we get as it pertains to a conversation revolving around what it is, is Gabby being like, oh, that's the Founding Titan. No, it's the true nature of Titans, which also kind of leaves us in a weird spot. Like, is it the Founding Titan or is it life? Because when Zeke and Armin are talking about manipulation and multiplication of a species, the image shown is obviously of the centipede thing. However, when you consider the fact that this centipede thing attaching to Ymir is what gave her the original Titan ability, and then Ymir would later become the Founding Titan, it's kind of hard for us not to assume the centipede's got something to do with that. Okay, so let's for a second assume that the centipede is the founding titan and that the founding titan has a vested interest in making sure that Aaron remains alive because when Aaron had his head shot off by Gabby it shot out of his spine to reconnect his head now one could pretty easily make the argument that this is something that life would do as Zeke says in his conversation with Armin that life is about manipulation and multiplication and death means that we can no longer multiply and that's where fear comes from and therefore when faced with the prospects of death something that is life incarnate would try to stay alive, but the same line of logic could also be applied to the Founding Titan. Regardless, it doesn't really matter. What does matter is the fact that Eren, in his massive Founding Titan form, has his head blown off. And once his head is blown off, the centipede escapes him. Well, more specifically, the centipede tries to reattach Eren's head, but Reiner decides to wrestle it. So, if we are assuming that that centipede thing is the Founding Titan, Eren no longer has the Founding Titan. Reiner's wrestling it. So, okay, cool. Aaron just got decapitated. He should be dead, right? 
Nope. See, not only does Eren not die, he then transforms into the Colossal Titan, whose powers, mind you, he doesn't have. Armin has them. And the only way that Eren would have the ability to turn into the Colossal Titan is if he had the Founding Titan's abilities. However, when you consider the fact that Zeke is dead and the centipede thing has left him, it makes us ask the incredibly logical question, how does Eren turn into a Colossal Titan? Does he still have the Founding Titan powers? Probably, but why? The logical answer is his connection to Ymir. But if his connection to Ymir is all he needs to control the power of the Founding Titan, why did Zeke's death do anything? Whatever, I guess it's just semantics. Who cares? It's a cool Colossal Titan fight. And it is a cool Colossal Titan fight. I, I, I mean, there's like two punches exchanged, but still. I mean, there's two punches exchanged in the manga. It could be longer in the anime. And while Eren and Armin are having the world's greatest jab exchange, does reach still matter when you're 80 meters tall? Reiner is busy wrestling with the world's most wriggly and gross entity. However, when the possible founding Titan realizes it might lose in this battle against Reiner, it decides to release a smoke. A smoke that creeps over the entirety of humanity's last stronghold. And just as you thought we were starting to head in a positive direction, as people like Annie and Gabby got reunited with their families, this smoke starts turning every single Eldian into Titans. Jean, Connie, Gabby. And this scene is absolutely brutal and also wildly unnecessary. In fact, this scene accomplishes nothing at all. See, the reason that the Founding Titan did this is so that it could have an army of Titans to battle against Raynor, so it could survive. And so, just as Eldians and Marleans are coming together to realize that this situation was brought on by needless hate, and Gabby and Annie are finally getting their much-needed reunions, and Jean and Connie have accomplished enough that now they get to sit back and watch all the big people fight, all of them are effectively killed. Yes, they're pure Titans, but unless there's a Titan Shifter around you that's willing to give up their life to turn you into a Titan Shifter, you're all but dead. And listen, I am all for an absolute gut punch in an anime. Akami Got Kill, one of my favorite shows of all time, but death is only really great in anime and manga when it serves a purpose. And yet, no, two fan favorite characters, Jean and Connie, wiped out just like that. And not only are we hypothetically wiping fan favorite characters off the map two chapters before the story is ending, it also completely derails what should have been the take home message from the entirety of the end of Attack on Titan that Marleans and Eldians are finding peace amongst each other. But now, instead, a vast majority of the Marleans get wiped out by pure Titans, completely derailing any progress towards the prospect of Eldians and Marleans co existing. And maybe one of the most important things happening during this moment is the fact that Falco's core motivation is to make sure that Gabby is safe. However, Falco as a Titan Shifter is unaffected by the smoke, but Gabby isn't. And while we're talking about core motivations, here's something I did like about the ending. The fact that Mikasa is the person to kill Eren. And I even like how Mikasa goes about killing Eren, because Mikasa has to battle the Ackerman ideology in her head that she shouldn't attack Eren. And she has this kind of flashback to an alternative future where her and Eren ran away from everything to live out the last four years of Eren's life. All of it is a really beautiful moment, and if anybody was going to kill Eren, it should be Mikasa. I even like the fact that Levi punches a hole in Colossal Titan Eren's teeth, and Mikasa jumps into his mouth and slices Eren's neck. You know what I don't like, though? Her kissing his decapitated skull. You know what's worse? Him kissing back. All of that. Bad. And somehow, it got worse. Because after Eren is defeated, it's revealed that Eren went to all of the people that were important in his life and told them why he was doing this. He then made each and every single one of those individuals forget so that the next time that they saw, they would kill him with no hesitation. However, after they finished the job, they would remember everything that Eren had told them. It's then revealed to Armin specifically that the reason he did this is so that he could paint these heroes of paradise as the saviors of the world. That is to say that Eren was trying to get the entire world to not only understand the possible power of parodies, but also hate him. So whoever killed him would be the world's hero. And that makes almost no goddamn sense. Okay, if we start from the beginning of this fight and assume that everything Eren is doing is so that he can be defeated at the hands of the heroes of Paradis, he did not have to kill 80% of the human population. Now, the reason that he gives is that so the rest of the world won't have enough strength to mount a defensive attack against the remaining Paradise Island residents. Why do we think they want to attack Paradise Island, Eren? You could have killed 
50% of humanity, 20% of humanity, even 10 probably would have got the message across. And then everybody could have been like, wow, good thing it didn't get to us. Those heroes from Paradise, great people. And not to mention that I fully understand through the power of the founding Titan, Aaron can see everything that will happen, has happened, and is currently happening all at once. Well, at least so long as within the capacity of during his life and before it, as he says to Armin that he doesn't know what's gonna happen after he dies. But without like three or four incredibly lucky breaks, Aaron would have killed all of those Paradise Island heroes. And sure, of course he knew that was all gonna happen. That's why he went as hard as he did. But here's the thing. Nobody could see the fight. The closest people to the battle were miles away and they were just like, oh, people just jumped out of a plane. Wonder what they're doing. Did we have to spawn every single Titan shifter in the history of Titan shifters? Like you could have made it a little bit easier for your friends to win, but that's really not that bad. That's genuinely splitting hairs. Aaron knew that they would win so he could do whatever he want because he saw the future. That makes sense. However, unfortunately, Aaron admitting this does present kind of a large issue for me. And that's our third and final issue with AOT's ending waffling. See, in the matter of one chapter, Aaron goes from the big bad antagonist to just the guy who was trying to make the entire world hate me so that my friends could kill me and they'd all be liked. It's a thematic change in a matter of pages. And mind you, an incredibly important thematic change. Sure, does it like kind of clear Aaron's name so everyone can be like, oh, he was a good guy. Sort of. Because here's the thing. Attack on Titan is incredibly complicated because the idea of free will doesn't really exist. See, the reason that Aaron was crying after Historia touched him is because he saw the future that was gonna happen. He saw that he was gonna have to stomp out 80% of humanity. And so everybody's like, oh, Aaron, thank you so much for taking on this burden for us. But like, all right, here's the thing. When Aaron is talking to Armin, he reveals to Armin that when Berthold is gonna die at the hands of the Smiling Titan, way in the beginning of AOT, that the reason that the Smiling Titan actually went to Aaron's house and ate his mother is because Aaron controlled the Smiling Titan to do that, showing that Aaron was able to go back in time to make sure that this current future happened. What does that tell us? That tells us that Aaron was able to make real life changes in history to ensure that an individual timeline happened. Because if Bearholt died at the hands of the Smiling Titan, then Armin never would have been able to eat Bearholt and he wouldn't have gotten the Colossal Titan power and then he wouldn't have been able to use the Colossal Titan power to kill Aaron. That makes sense unless you think about it. What this three or four panel moment tells us is not only did Aaron decide to distract the Smiling Titan by having it eat his own mother. I mean, there's so many other ways we could have distracted it. Not to mention, with the power of the Founding Titan, he could have just simply had it turn around. Hell, with the power of the Founding Titan, he could have had it rip out its own nape. But what this tells us is that Aaron has the capacity to change the past to make sure that individual futures happen, which means he could have just made sure this future didn't happen. If you can make actual changes in history to ensure that a future that you know is gonna happen will happen, what would happen if hypothetically Aaron didn't interfere with the Smiling Titan and the Smiling Titan ate Berthold? The future changes because now Dina is back and she's the Colossal Titan. So if Aaron has the ability to manipulate the past to make sure that a certain future happens, he could also manipulate the past to try to make sure that a different future happens. Which like, you could make a future where you don't have to kill 80% of humanity. It's, it's, it's not a crazy idea. And speaking of waffling, it's then revealed that Aaron, even though he was all cool, calm, and collected to Mikasa, and he was like, I want you to move on, is actually just kind of a whiny child. As after Armin punches him and says, oh, how dare you treat Mikasa like that? He's like, I don't want Mikasa to move on. I want her to think about me for a long time. Which by the way, incredibly selfish. She should move on. And two, once again, represents a massive waffling in theme. But then the waffling gets even worse because after Aaron dies, everybody who turned into pure titans, just alive again. Because now the power of the titans are gone. So all pure titans are turned back into humans. So why were all these people turned into pure titans? Did they help the founding titan defeat Reiner? We don't know. Aaron dies and then the centipede thing just disappears. We don't see Reiner defeated. We barely see Reiner battle against the pure titans. And What's crazier than all of us is the fact that the centipede just kind of gives up on getting Aaron's head because Aaron kind of reconnects his own head by becoming a colossal titan. So does the founding titan centipede thing die with Aaron? We don't know. And if that's not annoying enough, there's also the fact that every single one of the people who was turned into pure titans 
we're just death baited. Gabby's family gets back together. Annie's family gets back together. Gene and Connie are fine, which leads a lot of people to think like, oh, yay, they're back. But like, there was no reason for them to be turned into pure titans. And it kind of just sullies the moment. It also leads to this moment where the Marleans and the Eldians now no longer trust each other because all of the Eldians just turned into titans and killed a bunch of them. So all of the Eldians are like, look, we don't have powers anymore. Put your guns down. And Armin has to step up as the now new MC of the story and be like, I am Armin. I just killed the attack titan. We don't have powers anymore see because here's the thing well i thought killing connie and jean and gabby and gabby's family and annie's family was stupid and pointless it only becomes more stupid and pointless when you actually don't kill them also here's the thing obviously aaron dies and the power of the titans disappears right and it's like loosely implied that the reason that that happens is because Mikasa was chosen by Ymir to release Ymir from 2,000 years of servitude by killing Eren with love? That's, I don't, they, they never, they never say. And while admittedly, Eren didn't know what was going to happen after he died, so we didn't know that everybody's going to lose their Titan abilities, but how did that never cross anybody's mind? Oh, let's use the Founding Titan's ability to euthanize all Eldians. Oh, let's use the Founding Titan's ability to cause the rumbling. Hey, what if we just Cut the power off at the source. That should have been option one. But Nick, the rumbling in Aaron's death accomplished so much. Did it? The ending of the manga is literally just telling us that Paradise Island is still incredibly Jaegerist and that they're actively ramping up their military so that they can go and finish what Aaron started. Well, the rest of the world is still incredibly skittish at the concept of Eldians because they just killed eight out of 10 people. But Armin's like, don't worry, the world will always be in conflict. What? Uh. No, after a war that kills 80% of humanity, maybe we figure this whole peace thing out. Because the country of Eldia, which is now probably the strongest military force on Earth, because no squishies, is ramping up their military to go kill the remaining 20% of people, which means Eldians and Marleans have not come together. And sure, the tones of the end of the manga are, oh, Annie and Reiner are gonna work with Armin and Mikasa, and Marleans and Eldians are gonna come together and we're gonna find peace. But like Historia, one of the most beloved characters in all of AOT is ramping up the militarization efforts of Paradise Island. And it's like, sure, I get that the seven of you are close friends, but like, effectively, what did Aaron doing the rumbling accomplish? Like, we get to see Armin and everybody returning to, I guess now, New Eldia, three years after the rumbling is over. Well, it is a possibility that they'll be welcomed with open arms, on the ship, they're like, I wonder if they're gonna shoot our ship down. Cool, Aaron made you guys the heroes. Now your own island hates you. And it only cost billions of people. But don't worry, Aaron was doing it for a good cause. Oh yeah, and Aaron's a bird now. So I guess two Titan shifters have found the ability to fly. Listen, when it comes down to it, the ending of Attack on Titan is just so scattershot. There's no adherence to any overarching themes. Everybody is switching sides constantly. Nothing gets accomplished, and Eren's dead. Why Mikasa was able to break the cycle and free everybody from Titan powers, we're not entirely sure. How the Founding Titan's abilities work and how that ties into Ymir and the Centipede thing, we also don't really know. And if you really genuinely want to feel like all of this meant nothing, you could read chapter 139.5, which I don't know if they're going to adapt to the anime or not, where after Eren's head being buried in the ground by Mikasa, it grows a giant tree. A giant tree that after a couple of hundred years eventually forms a cavernous-like mouth. A cavernous-like mouth, kind of like the cavernous-like mouth that Ymir fell into after being hunted down. The boy and his dog discover said trait, which is very clearly telling us that the cycle is going to restart again and that he's going to get founding titan abilities and that while ymir has been freed from her shackles by her possible daughter mikasa this boy is going to probably become the new ymir and nothing means anything it's bad the way that i would have fixed this ending is very simple there's one of two ways to do it the first is just keep Aaron evil. Don't be like, oh, he was doing it for us because he saw the future. Just have him stick to his guns and be like, hey, listen, it's either they're going to destroy us or we destroy them. And I decided to pull the trigger first. Infinitely more compelling. Also introduces significantly less plot holes. You can run with the themes that absolute power corrupts absolutely and that sometimes the hardest choices require the strongest wills. Aaron died doing what he believed was right. Or you could say that the founding titan was corrupting the way that Aaron was thinking and it forced him into the situation and therefore, after he's decapitated in his Founding Titan form and the Centipede crawls out of him, he, while losing the power of the Founding Titan, still retains the Attack Titan's powers, which he then uses to assist everybody in the battle against the Founding Titan. They're both 
objectively much simpler endings than Attack on Titan's current ending, but they could also both technically accomplish what Eren was trying to accomplish. Let's say Eren does die as the big bad, and still everybody who killed him is viewed as a hero of Paradis. The Marleans would acknowledge the fact that some members from Eldia hold true virtues in their heart, then the Marleans could reach out to Eldia and say, we have no beef with you. We understand that you were put in this situation over generations of hatred. In fact, in I believe chapter 135, when the Marleyan captain is watching the rumbling come in, he makes the revelation that if he survives this moment, he will never treat an Eldian with unjust hate ever again, as this monster, that is Eren's founding titan form, was created through hatred. And that right there should have been the take-home message. However, that gets thrown out the window. Sure, some Marleans strap on the boots to help Eldia, but the take-home message should have been that Armin and all the other Eldians stepping up to destroy the strongest Eldian in existence showed the rest of the world that peace can exist between the two factions. However, for some reason, the manga is committed to the idea that conflict will never end. And thus, everything that Eren did is irrelevant. In the circumstance that Eren gets decapitated and has to battle against the Bounding Titan as the Attack Titan, this would also serve as an incredible moment of everybody not only realizing that the Eldians that came to attack Eren are for the side of humanity, but also Eren is actively trying to destroy titan powers and the marleans upon watching something like this happen realize that the eldians don't want this curse either that the eldians want to find a way to coexist with the rest of humanity they're willing to undergo losing their one edge that they hold over humanity titan powers if it means they can do that once again buying into the grander scheme of peace on earth but we didn't get that because well at least according to me the ending is a nightmare. But what did you guys think about Attack on Titan's ending? Would you change anything about it or did you love it just the way that it was? Tell me in the comments below. And while you're down there, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. All this from the guy who talks about Naruto all day long. I hate Naruto's ending too.